did want to address uh, one uh, question uh, I got in our um, course in our in our network, and the question was basically the the person said I'm enjoying uh, chanting Om Namah Shivaya, but I'm feeling really connected basically to sitting and listening to the chant, the recording without doing it myself. And <laughs> I took the question as, uh, it was a long uh, question, but I took the question as like, is this even meditating? You know, <laughs> like one, is this okay? Two, is this, um, is this meditating? You know, like, is this a good thing? I think um, they mentioned, you know, that they thought maybe that would change over time. Like they'd start chanting it themselves. They weren't sure. In a, in a uh, non-dualistic model, there's really no right or wrong. <laughs> However, you do need guidance because if, you know, the way we function, if we just kind of like walk around the world doing whatever, <laughs> the chances that we'll get where we want to go are, are, are not that great, it turns out. Um, but if you are in a contemplative state, um, whether you're saying the chant to yourself or listening to it um, or chanting it out loud versus internally, which was another question from before, um, doesn't really matter. Different traditions have different things they suggest um, as techniques. But more to the point is if a way of doing things is making one feel uh, very connected, and then it is likely a, a good choice. So, you know, the Spanda Karika would, would sort of argue that all things <laughs> can lead you, um, what Daniel Odier translates as, to the sacred tremor, to that part inside of yourself uh, that's connected to all things. You know, whether that's listening to a voice on a recording or uh, noticing how angry you are or being very wide open and just allowing things to happen on their own, um, whether that's mentally, physically, or both. Um, that text is about that, this sort of circular nature of things and getting very, very comfortable within it. So a teacher, like the teacher who wrote that book, might say back to the student, why are you even asking as the contemplation? Like, why are we even asking whether something is useful or not? Which, of course, to our linear mind, doesn't make a lot of sense, right? My linear mind is like, of course you're going to ask your meditation teacher about a meditation. Like, of course you are. Like, what? That's that's crazy talk. Um, but in this kind of radical, non-dual way of looking at things, it's a remembrance. For me, a lot of times it's really a remembrance that everything is absolutely as it should be and okay. We need our anxiety and fear, I was going to say worry, but worry and fear are kind of the same thing, are not needed because you are inherently spiritual. Like there's no such thing as spiritual and non-spiritual. So everything you're doing is spiritual. And especially if it's making you feel a certain way and you're having a felt experience of that spirituality, which is yours, then it, it cannot possibly be wrong. And the Yoga of Sutras would say, here's a bunch of stuff you might want to think about with that in mind. Like that's nice. If I was Patanjali, who wrote the Yoga Sutras, I might say, I have noticed um, when I'm behaving in certain ways or have a certain orientation, I don't achieve states and I don't have experiences of my spirituality. So here's like a more linear roadmap for you. So I'm sure we can all relate to that too, right? Like when we're only thinking about ourselves and, you know, getting a new TV and getting our kid to the doctor and how much money we're going to make next week, we often don't feel our spiritual nature. And the non-dualist would say, you should. And here's some ideas of how to do that. So they have those ideas. And the, and the, not, and the dualist would say, yeah, probably better off to like push some of that aside, at least for 
30 minutes a day on your mat and really focus in on this on this witness consciousness and then your spiritual nature in that way i don't i don't know if just walking around the world feeling it is going to work for you <laughs> so it's like that's one way to understand those two concepts they're both true they're both true how could it be if the whole practice of meditation is to know oneself that anything you do is it's not knowing yourself like that doesn't really make sense it's like kind of almost illogical it's also true that we probably know parts of ourselves better than others so the dualist would say you know you really want to pay attention to the parts that you're, you're not as familiar with you want to get all cozy with the parts of yourself that you've been avoiding or just didn't have any access to and that's why we have different techniques and different practices to encourage these different things so I've been helping people with their meditation practices for years. And when I'm talking to somebody about their life and their meditation practice, which as a non-dualist, I don't really see them as separate. These concepts, like the, the, the person I'm trying to help is talking and I'm hearing something that makes me really want to explain one of these concepts clearly to them because I can see that they've gotten a little disoriented it would be a good word right we're either oriented or we're disoriented <laughs> so sometimes your role as a meditation teacher is to orient and of course all of this applies for ourselves but when you're helping somebody else like how can i orient this person and they're telling me how they're not sure if their thing they're doing is okay or how it's just not all right and they're just like not the human being that they're supposed to be you know, sometimes it's really important to remind them that that's actually not true. And other times it's important to remind them that there are remedies. There are these dualistic sort of linear remedies to this problem. So, hey, what would it be like if you meditated in this way for the next six weeks? Maybe you wouldn't be having these feelings or thoughts, or those feelings and thoughts wouldn't be affecting you in the same way. So the Tao talks about this too. Like there's no good without bad, says the Tao, right? Like there's, they're not the same thing, says the Tao. However, they can't exist without each other. They're relative concepts. And so, yes, there's no like, here's the way you're supposed to live in order to be a spiritual person. It's like a defining moment. It's a great question. It's like a defining moment in the yoga sutras. That moment in the Yoga Sutras is in chapter two. And chapter two is written for sort of the least advanced yoga student in that book. There's four chapters, four different students. And chapter two, when I say least advanced, don't immediately judge. Like most people are in the least advanced, <laughs> including most of us here. It's like people who are like, things aren't going well. I want them to change. What do I do? <laughs> Right. And then so Patanjali's like one of Patanjali's suggestions is the yamas and niyamas, like like kind of like concepts to live by and things like to avoid, right? Abide, you know, ahimsa, like uh, abide in nonviolence, like uh, a mind that is sort of looking towards nonviolence is gonna have an easier time, right? Achieving some sort of spiritual <laughs> awakening which I think we could probably all get with, right? Like, I think we can all agree that uh, waking up in the morning and seeing how we can be cruel to ourselves and others probably isn't going to um, merge us with nature in some way. So, so that's why they're there. Um, you know, most of the time, and I, I don't want to be like super concrete about this because everybody's different. But my experience in working with people is most people go from one to the other. So everybody needs that at first. Everyone needs like, hey, Lita, you're not your thoughts. Really? Yeah, you're not your thoughts. Sit down and like watch your breath for the next three months. And with the understanding that you can just see your thoughts move around and you can have this experience that you are not them, right? Very linear, like very like, let's do this thing. And at the same time, here's some ideas, like try to be more content, try to live in a nonviolent way, you know, don't live in a way that's like greedy, <laughs> like these ideas, right? You might want to do that because it's going to support this for you. 
And you go, oh, okay, great. And then time goes by. Maybe this is your exact experience. I don't know. Um, time goes by. And then you're like, I'm going to check out this non-dual book because you know this random guy told me to read it. And you're reading this book. And the book is just like, you can find you can find this thing you're looking for anywhere because you are it. And that is the teaching. And you're like, yeah, but what do I do? And they're like, nothing. <laughs> but you need the right orientation. So I wrote this book. <laughs> or you can do these practices that are very non-dual in nature. Like there's a lot of possibilities coming out of them. There's not like a, a goal you're striving for. Whereas Patanjali is like, here's the goal, you know? concentrate get get your mind right so you can concentrate enough to move on to the next phase of this meditation process but yes there's no there's no ethical something that many people believe but like that i came to also in my own sort of evolution as a person is that you don't need ethics when you're when you know yourself because people who know themselves don't wake up in the morning and just decide to throw babies in the river or whatever, right? Like this isn't what this isn't what we do as humans. So that's kind of part of the argument too. Um, if you're if you're trying to see the differences between them, you know, when you're finding the sacred tremor, as that translator of the Spandarakita says it, you're not gonna you're not gonna do something different than the yamas and yamas are telling you to do. So their argument is like, why don't you just do that? <laughs> why don't you just do the practice, you know?